Christina, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very honored to have been invited to speak here. And as I look around the room and I've, after hearing these first few talks, my mind is absolutely blown. As I look at all these layers of deep convolutional nets in this room. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about an application of AI in GI, if I can figure out how to make this work, okay? Uh, disclosure, I'm a co-founder of a UCI um, applied innovation startup called DocBot which uh, is really the machine behind all of this that I'm gonna be showing you. And I think uh, first I'm gonna define the problem so you understand what it is that we we're trying to solve with this technology. One in 20 of us are gonna get colon cancer in our lifetimes if we don't undergo an appropriate screening. And up to 90% of these colon cancers could be prevented just by removing polyps and keeping those polyps out of your colon. And yet, for all of us who are up to date on our colonoscopies, well, let me phrase it another way. All the colon cancers diagnosed today, on this day in the United States, five to 9% of them are diagnosed in people who are up to date with their colonoscopies. So those are failures. Why not better? Well, there's four plausible explanations. You had your colonoscopy, but your polyp was missed. Uh, Maybe a polyp was found, but it wasn't removed completely. Uh, maybe the pathologist came back with some misleading information about what that polyp actually was. Or maybe you actually made a new polyp after the colonoscopy and it turned into cancer that fast. Well, it's estimated about 85% of these interval colon cancers are my fault. I didn't find the polyp or I didn't take it out completely. So, the batting average for a colonoscopist is their adenoma detection rate. So adenomas are the most common precancerous polyps out there. And the adenoma detection rate is the fraction of the screening colonoscopies that a colonoscopist does in which they find at least one adenoma. And as you can see from this chart, adenoma detection rates among colonoscopists are all over the place. From as low as about 7% to as high as 50%. And yet, the adenoma prevalence in the population is over 50%. So our ADR should be 50%. So that creates this gap, as you can see, where adenomas are missed in some fraction of, of the cases that people are scoping. And we also know from a couple of studies, one by Corley, another by Kaminsky, that for every 1% increase you can bring your ADR, you're gonna reduce the risk of your patient getting an interval cancer by three to 6%. So it's a big problem. So Medicare cares about this. They recognize that ADR is important and they've put benchmarks on us to achieve. If we are super good with ADR, they're gonna give us a bonus. If we're under the benchmark, they're gonna penalize us. So that's our actual reimbursement. There's also factors that affect ADR that have been recognized in the literature, including, you know, it's obvious. If you don't complete the whole colonoscopy, you're missing real estate, so your ADR will be lower. So that's the cecal inhibition rate. The cecum is the top of the colon. Uh, prep quality, obviously, if the prep isn't good, you're gonna miss things, and the withdrawal time. Any withdrawal time less than six minutes is associated with a dramatic drop in ADR. So in the good old days, we'd do a colonoscopy, we'd generate our report, we'd wait a couple of weeks for the pathology to come back, and then once that pathology came back, we would know what to tell the patient when they need to come back. We'd notify the patient, we'd notify the PCP, we'd generate a tickler file to make sure that patient was called at the appropriate time to come back for another colonoscopy. Well, I call that the good old days because the new days now we have to add on top of all of this, tracking our quality measures. So we have to, you know, appropriate indication and timing of the colonoscopy, what was the prep quality, what's our sequel innovation rate, what's our withdrawal time, what's our adenoma detection rate. And then we have to actually pay a registry to report that to CMS. So that adds a lot of headache to what we do. And on top of that, there's all these disconnects between the report we generate and the EHR. So all these things have to be interconnected. 
there's got to be an easier way. And I think that part of what I just showed you on that slide is what's uh, causing this, uh, this big problem with burnout in physicians. So progress doesn't come from early risers. Progress is made by lazy men looking for easier ways to do things. So this is where I came from, okay? So imagine an easier way. An AI-assisted colonoscopy starts. So the AI recognizes that it was out one moment and now it's in. It marks the time you inserted the scope. Then the prep may be terrible, right? So you've got a little bar over here on the left that's monitoring the quality of the prep and challenging you to improve that prep. And how about an AI, just like facial recognition, that can see the cecum? Here it can see the appendiceal orifice and the ileocecal valve. Marks your cecal time. And as you can see in the upper right part of the screen, uh, the prediction that it's a cecum is a one. The cecal time has been recorded down at the bottom. And then polyps. As Pierre showed you, AI in real time can find polyps during colonoscopy. But what if it could also tell you the size of the polyp, the shape of the polyp? These are all very important things in telling somebody when they need to come back for colonoscopy. What if it could also tell you what kind of a polyp it was, just by its appearance? What if it could also identify your tools so that you can do your appropriate coding and have your report automatically generated with everything you did and found? And now you're done. Your insertion time, your sequel time, your in time, all recorded. So it's complete. AI has recorded all the quality metrics. It's auto records your ADR because it knows what kind of polyps you found. It completes your colonoscopy report for you. It auto labels your images because it knows what's on each image. It does your coding. It gives you the guideline recommendations based on your findings. You just simply review, edit, embellish, and any changes you make, maybe that could even go back into teaching the AI to get smarter. So turning this into this is the dream, and to have this at the point of care. So that's where all this starts. So how's it done? Well, you've heard some great talks today kind of explaining all of this. But the hard part, I'm calling it the hard part because it's not the hardest part, is to produce the algorithm. You ask, you start with a clinically relevant question, which I think I've presented to you. Um, access a large, accurately annotated segmented database with your specific task in mind. And we were fortunate at UCI, when I started at UCI in 2012, I started a colonoscopy quality database that prospectively collected all of this information including all the images and the pathology associated with every picture of every polyp. So we had some data to start with, which was nice. And then get involved in, in a, a good a, with a good AI team to help you solve your problem with AI. Now, I'm not an AI expert by any means. And then the hardest part, you have your AI. It can do all these things, at least on paper. It's validated on image set that it's never seen before and it looks great, your area under the curve is 0.995, um, you still have to implement this. You have to be able to run it live. And with colonoscopy, it's a live video you're watching, 60 frames per second, ultra high definition. How are you going to make all these AIs run on each frame and give you feedback? So <clears throat> it has to be real time, non-distracting, reliable, low maintenance, low cost. Hardware agnostic, in other words, it should work with any scope, no matter the manufacturer. Um, should be able to integrate with the IT infrastructure and the EHR. Um, and then it needs to be validated. That's clinically validated in a diverse group of endoscopists, a diverse group of patient population and systems. And then to actually get it out there with any claims, FDA. So it's a long road. Fortunately, as I said, we had the data, over 10,000 colonoscopies, over a million colon images, 180,000 colon polyp images linked to their pathology, uh, over 100 colonoscopy videos that then we could extract additional images from, which accounts for 
a lot of images. And when we went to Pierre with this, he said, what a beautiful problem. I'll never forget the way he phrased that. And so uh, here's basically what we did. We, uh, the, another nice thing about our data set is that, is that we had a massive diversity of different kinds of polyps, shapes, and sizes. So it's not like taking 100 videos that may have 20 different polyps, but extracting 100,000 images of those polyps. We had diversity of polyps. And then just basically divided up into two groups. No polyp versus polyp, as Pierre said. Get an army of people to draw little boxes around all of these polyps, which we did. And our first uh, presentation was at ACG two years ago. This was, uh, as Pierre pointed out, our, our area under the curve at the time was 0.91. Accuracy was 96.4%. And then we went ahead and did a video validation. So we took uh, nine colonoscopy videos. These were de-identified, so we don't actually know what the polyps were on these videos. Um, and on review of the videos, there were 28 polyps that were removed, and we knew that because we could see the polyp being removed. We had uh, three expert colonoscopists who had ADRs of 50% review these videos. They found an additional eight polyps. Then we had them review the videos with the AI, and they found nine more polyps, including a fairly significant flat polyp. And actually, the video that Pierre showed showed that one flat polyp. I don't know if you can remember it, but uh, up in the ascending colon. And we got this published in Gastro just this last October. And more importantly, the AI didn't miss any polyps that were identified by the reviewers. So there's other problems in GI that we can solve with AI, and I'm just always looking for the pain points um, to make my life easier. For example, there's capsule endoscopy. It's a capsule about the size of the tip of your pinky that has a video camera in it. You swallow it, it has a radio transmitter, it gets recorded to a device you carry around with you, and it takes about 12 hours to get through your system. That means it's recorded a 12-hour video. Somebody has to review that video. <laughs> And uh, that's not really very much fun, particularly when the reimbursement is uh, far less than what your plumber gets paid. Um, and more importantly, in all the studies that have looked at capsule endoscopy to find out how often significant lesions are missed, 40% are missed. So this, you know, it's a cool technology, but it's a painful one. Another is Barrett's esophagus, so chronic reflux, acid reflux, can lead to a change in the lining of the esophagus uh, called intestinal metaplasia, named after Dr. Barrett. And this represents a precancerous lesion, just like polyps are. And then they can form dysplasia, which is that first step toward cancer. Dysplasia to the untrained eye is really hard to see, but to the trained eye is pretty easy to see. So we're now training AI to recognize dysplasia, to be able to show, it, show us the spots to target as we scope people. Ulcerative colitis. Um, the, there's a lot of work on different drugs and treatments to improve ulcerative colitis, but one of the problems is how do you assess mucosal healing? There's a scoring system, but it has to go to professional scores to get scored for these uh, multinational um, studies. What if we had AI just do the scoring for us? Totally unambiguous. Um, and then endoscopic ultrasound. Pancreatic lesions on endoscopic ultrasound. Are they cancer? Are they simple cyst? Do they need attention? Can we ignore them? That's another place we're going. So where are we now? So as a lot of the previous speakers have said, you need you need the data, you need to label the data, you need to train your AI, then you need to validate video on video and images, um, then create your interface, then get your clinical validation, then go to FDA, then maybe finally implement live. So where are we now? Uh, polyp detection, we're now up to 99.5% accurate with an area under the curve of 0.995. 
Optical pathology, the ability to distinguish a precancerous polyp, such as an adenoma, from a non-precancerous polyp, such as hyperplastic polyp, we're at 94% accuracy. Very accurate in recognizing the cecum. And, of course, when the scope's in and out. PrEP quantitation, it's about 95% accurate relative to the Boston Bow PrEP score. It's really good at recognizing tools now. Um, it's getting better at polyp size. IBD scoring still needs a little work. Uh, the Barrett's, we're up to 90 plus percent accurate now already. We have a presentation coming up at DDW. Capsule endoscopy, it looks like it's going to be amazing. And we're still developing EUS. So um, what about AI for polyp pathology? Well, the reason this is important, not only automated ADR, so you don't have to wait for PATH, keep your Excel spreadsheet so that you can report your ADR to CMS, but if it's being monitored for you on every colonoscopy you do by AI, that headache is gone. Um, but another important reason for doing <clears throat> optical pathology is that 80% of the polyps we take out are diminutive, and they're almost never important in terms of <coughs> cancer. But they may be adenomas or they might be hyperplastic, and it's important to know. Potentially, we could save a billion dollars a year if we could just take those polyps out, know what they were, and throw them away, and not send them to pathology. There's two guidelines that uh, the American College of Gastroenterology have put together where an optical pathology system has to meet these guidelines to be usable. One is diagnose and leave. You just look at it and leave it alone because you know it's a nothing in the rectum or, as I said, resect and discard. And that's based on a 90, greater than 90% concordance in what you, when that patient needs to come back. So the pathology tells us, based on guidelines, when we need to tell a patient to come back for the next colonoscopy. So the optical path should be 90% concordant with the true path relative to what you tell the patient. Okay. All right. And then, and then another thing. I mean, a lot of you I see have enough gray hairs to have had colonoscopies before, and half of you, I would assume, have had at least one polyp. But the doctor, when you're in recovery, ready to go home, says, I'll call you in a couple of weeks to let you know what it was. But what if you could just say right then and there what it was? So um, we've been able to achieve the diagnosis and leave threshold with a negative predictive value for adenomas of 97%. And um, what we've been able to achieve a 93.4% concordance with our optical path. So <clears throat> this is a video. And I'm going to show you multiple AIs running simultaneously on this video. In the upper left, you can see the Boston Bowel Prep score. Currently, it's a three. That's the best. The, whether a tool's being used, whether you're in the cecum or not, this particular image is the cecum. It's looking right at the uh, appendiceal orifice. And whether the scope is inserted or not. Over on the right is the prediction that a polyp is on the screen and what the pathology of that polyp is. And a little box will show up whenever there's a polyp. So the cecum's been identified here. Little polyps found there. It's predicted to be an adenoma. There's a snare. It recognizes the snare. Here's another polyp predicted to be a serrated polyp or a hyperplastic polyp. Here it recognizes that we're using an endocuff, these little fingers to pull folds back. Here it recognizes we're using our forceps. Here's a demo that this runs live. So on the left is, is the video stream with the AI running. On the right is the live video. And you can't see the predictions, but uh, this one is a hyperplastic polyp. The other one was a uh, 
adenoma. So um, <clears throat> timeline to practice. Polyp detection, if, we're, if our claim is it's going to improve our ADRs by using it, that's going to require FDA clearance and um, some fairly rigorous multi-center studies to prove it. Polyp path, if our, if our claim is going to be that uh, we can resect and discard, obviously that's going to require some really rigorous work to get FDA clearance. Uh, diagnosis of dysplasia in Barrett's, that's going to require FDA. But for documentation, that doesn't require FDA. So we'll be able to get this out pretty soon. And for capsule endoscopy, it's no different than what capsule endoscopy, the software is using now. It has a, 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 a suspected blood indicator. And it will show you all the images where it thinks it sees blood. And this is just based on the color of pixels. We can do the same thing with abnormality, for example. So the future, real-time multi-AI feedback during colonoscopy, uh, <clears throat> real-time quality data collection, documentation reporting, maybe improve our ADR, maybe allow us to diagnose and leave or resect and discard, um, diagnose and target dysplasia in Barrett's, AI-assisted capsule endoscopy reads. These are all the things we're thinking or developing now, and there's more to come. So I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, the Chow Comprehensive Digestive Disease Center, Dr. Chang, has been 100% behind this from the very start. Uh, the nurses are responsible for all this prospective data getting into this database live during the colonoscopy. The fellows, residents, and medical students who assisted in the annotations. Pierre Baldi and Gregor, uh, who provided the proof of concept that the polyp detector is, is, can work. And DocBot. It's, as I said, a UCI Applied Innovations Company. It's now a Y Combinator company up in the Bay Area. Uh, includes Andrew Nen, or Andrew Nen, who's our CEO. Tyler Dow, who worked the magic to run this live. And James Recua, he's our AI engineer. Uh, myself, Jason Samarcina, and uh, Peter Crosby. Thank you. We don't know the accuracy in real time. We just don't know that. Um, and this was just one way to try to validate it on videos as to whether it actually picked up additional polyps that looked like they were truly were polyps that were missed by the first review and not, and not removed by the original colonoscopy. That's all it really was. <laughs> well, what, in practice, what I've, what I've found is that uh, there are very few false positives, but whenever a box does show, it does call my attention to it. And if I take a close look at it and I don't think it's a polyp, I'm going to leave it alone. If, it, if I say, yeah, it helped me find a polyp, then those polyps are always removed. In real, you know, that's the way it is, it's done in real practice. Any other questions? Uh, that's, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.